and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, Liz Wheeler joins us to discuss her new book, Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists Behind the Attack on America's Kids. We're going to dissect the ways the left has infiltrated our cultural institutions and weaponized our government, and Liz will also outline the ways we can save our children and our country because, as she writes, defeat is not an option. Before we jump into the conversation, a little bit more about Liz. She is the host of the nationally renowned video podcast, The Liz Wheeler Show, where she defines the battles that will shape our nation for the next century and serves as your guide to the front lines of the culture wars. Liz is also the former host of the highly rated cable news program, Tipping Point with Liz Wheeler, and a national bestselling author of Tipping Points, How to Topple the Left's House of Cards. Liz, a pleasure to have you on She Thinks today. Hi, Beverly. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So this new book, and I think it just came out about two or three weeks ago, so people can go on Amazon and get or wherever else you may get your books. Um, But as you say, the left is waging a deliberate, relentless attack on our children. We're going to get into the how they're doing that. But let's start with the why. Why our kids? Yeah, so I I chose the word Marxist very carefully. In fact, I had to fight for that word to be included in the title of my book because it tells us all we need to know. We as Republicans oftentimes are so nice, we're so well-intentioned, we like to give the benefit of the doubt that we forget to accurately identify our political enemies. They're not just well-meaning opposition with unwise solutions to problems that we all agree are problems that need to be fixed. If you really dive into who is behind these attacks on our kids, you'll find that they're Marxists. And it actually explains why they're attacking kids, too, why children have become their primary target. I mean, a lot of parents saw this during COVID when they would just look over their kid's shoulder on Zoom school and they see critical race theory and trans ideology and 1619 Project. The Marxists realize that a communist can't just go out as a politician and say, hey, citizens, voters, let's change the United States from a free market capitalist nation to a communist nation. Vote for me. Not many, maybe a few Bernie bros, maybe a few AOC constituents would would fall for that. But most people would reject that. Marxists understand that in order to change a country from a free country to a communist country, you have to capture the minds of young people, especially small children, before they have properly learned right from wrong. Um, So they're going after our children in an attempt to ideologically remake our country. And in this book, you refer to them as the new Marxist. Can you just break down for us when you're referring to new Marxists, how are they different than the old Marxists? Yeah, this is a good question. So a lot of times when we think of Marxism, we think of Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto, as we should. It is named after him. But that's an economic version of Marxism. He proposed that the working class should revolt against the ruling class and overthrow capitalism. And he envisioned, when he published the Communist Manifesto, he envisioned this global Marxist revolution happening as a result of it. That didn't really happen. There were some Marxist revolutions, but by and large, it wasn't a global Marxist revolution. And economic Marxism of the style of Karl Marx went out of fashion politically for a little while, but it was revived in the 21st, it it was revived in the 20th century for the 21st century by an Italian Marxist named Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci was actually the co-founder of the Italian Communist Party, and he was thrown in prison in fascist Italy. And while he was in prison, he studied Marxism, but not just the not just the ideology. He studied what made the successful Marxist revolutions successful. And what he identified is it wasn't just economic discontent. It wasn't just the working class being mad at the ruling class that caused the successful Marxist revolutions to be successful. What made them successful is when first the cultural institutions on which the working class relied were destroyed or captured. And he named, among others, the media, the education system, religious institutions, the law, and the nuclear family. So when I'm talking about Marxists, all Marxists have the same goal. They want to abolish capitalism. They want to overthrow the free market. They want authoritarian rule. But cultural Marxists, these new Marxists, understand that their strategy is different than just, like I said, it's different than just the working class revolting against the ruling class. First, they have to attack these cultural institutions, and then they'll move to the governmental institutions. And we're going to get into some of those different areas, like education, for example. But how is there proof that there is a concerted effort among these different collective groups, that there's actually some type of concerted effort and organization between these different facets that are working together? 
Yeah, I mean, l- like any like any political effort or a movement, they it can be a loosely loosely correlated, but the ideology or the ideological thread ties them all together. And I'll give you an example of what I mean here. We have the president of the American Library Association, who's been in the news a lot the last month or so. Her name's Emily Drabinsky. Many people hadn't heard of her before she started making the news because she's one of the biggest proponents of keeping the sexually graphic books in children's schools and keeping books that push a critical race theory narrative in children's schools. But last year when she won election for this position as president of the American Library Association, she sent out a tweet and her tweet read, who would have thought that a Marxist, actually she said a lesbian Marxist, would win the presidency of the American Library Association? So we look at her and we say, okay, well, that's not just us inferring that her ideology resembles or is identical to a Marxist ideology. She is saying that she is a Marxist. And what's doubly interesting is she would not, Emily Drabinsky would not have won that election had not Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, thrown her political weight, her endorsement behind Drabinsky. So, yes, there is a coordinated effort between, you know, the Library Association and and the teachers unions to use the public schools to indoctrinate children in in an ideology that they admit. And that's just one example of many. And I want to talk about this term Marxism. I know that when we look at the term socialism, that that is viewed more favorably among the younger generations and kids these days where they look at it favorably. Are we seeing that even the term Marxist, being a Marxist is is something that young people think of as being a good thing to be attached to? I don't know that it has the same prevalence. This is an interesting point because I don't know that it that young people know the term Marxism the way that they know socialism. Bernie Sanders, for better, for worse, made the word socialism cool. He doesn't live like a socialist. He, of course, lives like a capitalist, profits off of it, benefits off of it, owns several homes, sells his books for millions of dollars. He is a committed capitalist, if you will. But, you know, when he was challenging the establishment during the 2016 primary or the 2015 primary, he made that term sound cool. The same with AOC. I mean, she's she's. For all of her ideology being poisonous, she's the hip young congresswoman. She actually talks on TikTok and does live streams on Instagram. And young people find her to be dynamic because she does have a charismatic personality, talks about socialism favorably. You know, they children, especially young adults, I think, are oftentimes duped by the idea of being fair or being empathetic. So it doesn't surprise me that socialism has a more positive connotation. You'll see the term Marxism in the next in the coming years, perhaps even in the coming months. Uh, become sanitized. You'll hear the term Marxism be used by some of these more radical activist organizations as something that they are proud of. The Black Lives Matter movement, for example, the founders, Alicia Garza and Patrice Coolers, they admit that they are trained Marxists. So that that shouldn't surprise a lot of us when we see what the Black Lives Matter movement was actually trying to do. But I, I understand that the term socialism and Marxism don't have the same connotation yet. But this ideology is becoming so apparent that even the activist class, not just the academic class, are beginning to embrace it as something that they want, something that's cool. And it's probably something we should we should look at as well. So you, you start hearing the word Marxist being used in a favorable way. You know that there is a this coordinated effort is getting traction and we need to be aware of that. And I want to pick up on something you were saying about the library system. And you were talking about pornography in schools. There's a lot of discussions about people who don't want pornography in children's literature as banning books, um, that all of a sudden there are these book banners out there. But I think there is something that's just prevalent within the education system. And it seems that adults want children to be educated in sex and talk about sex the sex ed of my generation is not the sex ed of today. Why is there this big push on sexual education in this way? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is just a profit motive of Planned Parenthood, believe it or not. Planned Parenthood, we, we associate with being the biggest abortion provider in our country, but Planned Parenthood is also um, one of the biggest providers of, quote unquote, sex education or comprehensive sexuality education is what they call it in schools. So they go in schools and they teach children all of, not just about the mechanics of sex or the biology of sex or anything that might be remotely appropriate in school, although I'd still probably argue not. Planned Parenthood goes in and, and teaches kids weird perverted sex stuff and how to sneak around and have sex and encourages children to experiment with perverted sexual things. And the reason for that is, A, it fills their pipeline of young women who need abortions, which profits them. And then Planned Parenthood is also one of the largest providers of transgender hormone therapy, 
in the country. And so they go in and they indoctrinate young kids in the transgender ideology, tell girls that they can be boys if they want to, boys that they can be girls if they identify as such. And that just provides for them customers several years later when these young people come calling for transgender hormones. So that's that's one part of it. The other part of it is uh, the, the transformation or their agenda is the transformation of these young children into Marxist revolutionaries. And here's what I mean when I say that. It's no coincidence that critical race theory and transgender ideology showed up very quickly one after the other in in our children's schools. It might seem how are those two connected, but they are connected when it comes to the strategy of the Marxist because critical race theory tells white children you're racist based on the color of their, your skin, not your actions, not your thoughts, not your character, just your skin color. And because of that, you are you can't redeem yourself from this racist this racist identity that you have. And when you tell this to young children, it creates an identity crisis because they're told they're bad and they're evil. There's nothing they can do about it. So they begin to, this this self-loathing begins to fester. They begin to feel animosity towards their parents. And as this identity crisis is festering, in swoops the transgender ideology telling them, well, you can't disassociate from your white identity, but you can put on a marginalized identity and have that be your primary identity. You can discard your oppressive whiteness in favor of, say, a transgender identity, a non-binary identity, an LGBTQIA identity. It's offering these children redemption from having been told they were evil. And what happens in the process is these children are radically alienated from their parents who, quote unquote, made them bad. And they're secured forever as at least Democrat ideologues, if not outright Marxist revolutionaries, because they have to be. Otherwise, they are told that, according to the Marxist worldview, they are evil. So this this effort to sexualize our children or this this transgender propaganda in schools was never about inclusion. It was never about tolerance. That was pretty obvious to most conservatives that it was never about equality under the law, but it's even more insidious than that. It is, their goal is the radical alienation of children from their parents because the Marxists understand that the nuclear family is the best bulwark against evil and against communism, although I repeat myself, that any government could ever possibly create. And one of the things that COVID did provide was this opportunity for parents to see what their kids were being taught. How long is this type of these theories, the ideology, how long has it been in our school systems? Yeah, this was a very interesting thing that that I realized in the course of researching this book. It's actually the origin of the book was I wondered, as a lot of parents did during COVID, why is this escalating now? We, we've known about liberal bias in schools, especially at the university level, for a long time. It's, and it's been growing worse, but all of a sudden there was this escalation. And that's when I started wondering, well, who's behind this? What, what is their goal? What do they want? And I, what I realized was actually very frustrating. Not only is this attack not new, it is escalating. It's not new, but it was planted decades and decades before. First, these radical Marxists took over our teachers' colleges, like Columbia Teachers' College, it, just filled itself with Marxists who taught, trained other teachers to disseminate this ideology all over the country. So back in the 1960s, our institutions began to be captured by this ideology. And then very slowly, they overtook teachers unions and library associations and curriculum boards and school boards. All the while, you would think, okay, well, what were Republicans doing? Not individual conservatives necessarily, but what was the Republican Party doing? They are the political apparatus that we're supposed to count on to fight back when the left inevitably attacks our freedom and our families. And yet here we are living in this cultural madness where, again, white children are told they're racist, black children are told they're oppressed, and boys are told they can be girls. Clearly something the Republican Party is doing, some strategy is not an effective strategy. And that was really the impetus for writing this book because I am tired of losing these culture wars. We really are at this moment in our country where it could go very wrong very quickly. It could, we're not going to be able to recover if we are not able to dissent against evil, and we're right on the cusp of that. Well, before I continue the conversation with Liz, I want to take a moment to ask you, our listeners, a question. Are you sick of the extremes in politics? Want a fresh look at the policies impacting you most from a nuanced perspective? Then I've got a show for you. Every Wednesday morning, the Base Politics Podcast is tackling the top stories of the week and helping listeners keep up with our swiftly moving political landscape. Hosted by Hannah Cox and Brad Palumbo, the Base Politics Show is dedicated to teaching you how to think, not what to think. You can find it on your favorite podcast platform by searching Base Politics or go to basepolitics.com to learn 
more. Liz, I want to pick up on something you're talking about with the education system. I think one of the most encouraging things is seeing how many people took their kids out of public education, many of them homeschooling, um, deciding to go in a different route. But you talk about in the book that the homeschool the homeschoolers are being attacked. What are Marxists trying to do to, to parents who want to teach their own kids? Yeah, the Marxists recognize that homeschooling poses an existential threat to what they're trying to use the public school system for, which, of course, is the mass indoctrination of children in this Marxist ideology in order to remake our population and what we believe. So let me just back up before we even get into the homeschooling stuff. Let me back up. So when I was researching the public school system in our country In the course of writing this book, I was reading about its origin. Public schooling did not become compulsory in our country until 1852. Massachusetts was the first state to make it mandatory. And the reason they did is because there was an influx of immigrants that came to our country at the time, predominantly Catholic immigrants. And the Protestant politicians in charge of Massachusetts wanted these immigrant children indoctrinated with American values so that they would be loyal to America first versus the country of their birth. And they wanted them indoctrinated in Protestant values because of the centuries-old battle between Protestants and Catholics. And I realized our education system actually is supposed to be an indoctrination center. That's what it was, in, that was it, what it was intended to be. It was designed for that. It's just that indoctrination we think of negatively because of what the left is indoctrinating our children with. But indoctrination itself as a concept is a morally neutral concept. It does depend on what is being indoctrinated to determine whether it's good or bad. So one of the things I do in my book is I challenge conservatives as we reorient our minds to fight back effectively against this assault or against this takeover of our institutions, we have to stop thinking that the education system can be a neutral apparatus. You're never going to teach just reading, writing, and arithmetic when you have adults in charge of children for six or eight hours a day. There will be some values that are imparted to those children, and it's either going to be Democrat ideologies or it's going to be Republican values, which are American values and Judeo-Christian principles. And so I challenge Republicans to think about these institutions in a little bit different of a way and reject this idea, this mistake the Republican Party has made of believing in neutrality because there is no such thing as neutrality. And the left, Beverly, understands this. That's why they are trying to enact a presumptive ban on homeschooling. Because if they're using the public school system to indoctrinate every child, they don't want a single dissenter, they don't want a single intact nuclear family, then they can't have millions of children, because that's what we have now, who are homeschooled. They can't have a hefty percentage of, even if it's a small percentage, a hefty minority, I should say, of the population in the future of that generation being Christian or conservative, believing in limited government, loving America. They can't have that or their ideological takeover won't be complete. And so they do what they always do. They say, well, we're going to try to codify our values into law. No such thing as neutrality, no such thing as tolerance, no such thing as inclusion. We're going to try to force you to adhere to our beliefs. Because again, the left doesn't believe in neutrality and they know either their values are going to prevail or ours are. And another area you talk about that I think is such a key area, it's not just the education system, it's where many of our kids are spending a lot of their time and that's on their screens, their phones, through social media, through TikTok, Instagram, fill in the blank, whatever they're using. How is big tech trying to push a Marxist ideology through the phones that our kids use? Yeah, and in a couple of different ways. The Some of the big tech companies like Facebook and Instagram, I guess that's the same meta, Google and YouTube, also the same company, Alphabet, and not Twitter anymore, thank goodness. But many of these big tech companies have done the bidding of, of, of leftist government officials, right? We saw evidence of that during the 2020 election. It ramped up during COVID, or it began to ramp up during COVID when we were censored for Um, for criticizing or dissenting from what the quote-unquote experts said, particularly Dr. Fauci. And the point that I make in my book is that this was not a random occurrence. This was not an isolated incident where you had this government bureaucrat, this tiny, power-hungry little man who got out of control. He's actually an illustration of technocracy. Technocracy is what's known as rule by the experts. And rule by the experts, again, is not a coincidence. Rule by the experts or technocracy is an old method of trying to transition from capitalism to communism. In fact, I I researched the origin of technocracy because it's becoming so prevalent in our country. If you're not a scientist, you're not an expert, you're not a doctor, you're not this, you're not that, you as a regular person, even a mom or a dad, doesn't have a right to, to have any opinions on these things. 
Well, I researched the origin. The origin comes from French socialists, and there was a Russian, a Bolshevik physician named Alexander <coughs> Bogdanov who actually wrote a fiction book, believe it or not, uh, at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in which he said technocracy is a stepping stone from capitalism to communism. And his argument was as soon as you take away the ability of the people to participate in their governance, even in the name of science and technology being more important than somebody's opinion or ideology, then you have taken away the voice of the people. We are seeing that not only in our federal government, but in these sort of public-private partnerships like our healthcare system, and like, especially like moms and dads recognize this from your pediatrician's office, you will not question anything that you are told because you are not the doctor. We are seeing the prevalence of technocracy increase, and it's not a coincidence. Its origin is Marxist ideology. And so final question for you. I think a lot of people are have the same concerns that you do. You've done the research and put all the pieces together. What can people do? Well, one of the things that I challenge conservatives to do is we need to reorient our thinking. The Republican Party has for a long time defined freedom. Like you and I sitting here, we think of ourselves as living living in a free nation. It might be under threat or under duress, but it's a free nation. But we need to grapple with the question, well, what does that mean? What, what is freedom? How do you define liberty? And the Republican Party for a long time has defined liberty as that is the end goal. If we can secure the maximum amount of individual liberty for each person, then we are being successful in our governmental endeavors. And I challenge that viewpoint in my book, and I challenge conservatives to grapple with this question, because if that's true, if this definition that the Republican Party is offering us is true, then what David French said when he once said that drag queen story hour is a blessing of liberty... That would have to be true because those grown men have the freedom to do that in front of children. And yet you and I sitting here, we know that there's no inherent morality in that. It's grotesque. It's evil. Uh, I reject that. So the definition of liberty must not be that liberty is an end to itself. It must be that liberty is a means to something greater. And the Republican Party has either lost sight of this or completely neglected Um, the true definition of liberty as defined by the framers of our Constitution, and that is the means to something greater, the means to justice, the means to securing natural law. And if we don't reclaim that belief and that definition of liberty, that that ability to harness um, morals and objective truth and order our society towards something greater, then we're going to continue to fail because the Republican Party's definition of liberty has led us to where we are now. And there's such important questions, and you outlined so much in this book. It is called Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists Behind. The Attack on America's Kids came out just last month. Liz Wheeler, thank you for your work on this book, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Beverly. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us. Before you go, IWF wants you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. An investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. So please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting IWF.org backslash donate. That is IWF.org backslash donate. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or review. It does help, and we'd love it if you shared this episode so your friends can know where they can find more She Thinks. From all of us here at IWF, Thanks for watching.